Someone gave us a pass to a nearby museum. On the day we went there, they were having a special exhibition of photographs along with their regular collection. I know a few American photographers, Walker Evans, Edward Weston, Edward Steichen, Alfred Stieglitz, Ansel Adams, Diane Arbus, Cindy Sherman, but I had not heard of the one responsible for this display, Edward Curtis. Later, I looked up a site on the internet, the Swami that knows all, namely the 100 most influential photographers of all time, and he was not there. So I looked him up. His family was poor because his father had been incapacitated in the Civil War. As a young boy, he built himself a camera, so there was early interest there. The family moved to the Puget Sound area. He bought a camera and began work successfully in a portrait studio. In 1899, he won a national photography contest with three pictures in soft focus with a sepia tint. Two of the pictures were of the daughter of the Indian chief for whom Seattle is named. So there was interest there, too. Curtis liked to go hiking and climbing to find subjects for his photography, leaving the studio work for others. On one such expedition on Mount Rainier, he helped a party that had gotten lost, making two influential friends in doing so, Edward Harriman, a railroad magnate, and George Bird Grinnell. Harriman arranged for him to be the chief photographer on an exploratory party to Alaska in 1899. Grinnell, the editor of Field and Stream magazine, with a driving interest in Native American culture, helped Curtis visually document the sun dance over a five-day period in Montana before that ceremony was banned by the U.S. government. From there, Curtis went with Grinnell to a Hopi reservation in Arizona. By 1904, Curtis had hired a man to run the photographic studio in Seattle and had embarked on an ambitious plan to photograph all the viable Indian tribes west of the Mississippi River. He had a meeting with President Theodore Roosevelt, who took to him and introduced him to J.P. Morgan, who agreed to help finance the extensive project, offering Curtis $15,000 a year for five years. Of course, it took much longer and cost a great deal more than that. Morgan died in 1913. In 1916, Curtis's wife filed for divorce. Like other artists, Curtis sacrificed his personal life for his work. He earned some money by working in Hollywood, and he kept at his project because he could clearly see that through assimilation and the harsh life on reservations, the American Indian was a vanishing race. In 1930, that's over 25 years later, he published volumes 19 and 20 of the North American Indians. In all, 225 full sets were produced, but interest in the subject had flagged. People had turned their attention to other things that had nothing to do with Indians, and Curtis was ruined. The work was scattered. Some of it went to Boston to a rare book collector. When Curtis died in the early 1950s, he did write a small obituary in the New York Times, which called him an expert on Native American Indians and a photographer. Which brings me to the exhibition we saw. About a hundred photographs out of the 40,000, I think, that survived him. Some landscapes, a few group shots depicting tribal activities, artifacts like baskets and bowls, but it's the portraits that stay with you. Chiefs, a mother and her papoose, a dandy, a young girl, two old women, an unidentified man. Curtis also made recordings, but the exhibit we saw was silent as a funeral parlor. I stared at these people, mute, staring back out, and it felt like an accusation. The two great stains on the honor and history of this nation, America, are slavery and the displacement and systematic eradication of the North American Indians. It was not prompted by cruelty. 
We had things to do and they were in our way. We cleared them out and went about our business. Curtis captured what was left of them before it disappeared completely. He did so using special techniques that make the portraits look almost embalmed. There are stories of people who did not want their pictures taken because they thought the camera could steal their souls. In many of the pictures Curtis made, I thought I could feel the person in the frame saying something like, Go ahead and take it. I give it to you. Take my soul. It's all I have left. And there it is, hanging up on a wall. I just finished reading a book entitled Human Smoke, and here was more of it. I saw the smoke and traced it to a campfire, burned out, only cold ashes left, and these pictures. I have to wonder if someday someone will find the little that remains of us, maybe a few tweets or something on Twitter.